In three, two, one, go ahead, sir. Good morning, welcome to Thurston County Board of County Commissioners, Commissioner's check-in for Thursday, March 4th, 2021, 10.01 a.m. My name's Ty Mentor, Chair of the Board. We have Vice Chair, Commissioner Gary Edwards, um, participating virtually. We will have Commissioner Mejia. Uh, she's, she's walking in. Walking right in, I heard her in the hall. Um, uh, County Manager Amir Chavez, Clerk of the Board, Amy Davis, as well. The public can follow along with this meeting through our county YouTube channel or join by conference call at 360-252-9020. PIN is one, two, three, four. Uh, agenda today begins with item one, which is DOCC meeting agenda format. Yeah, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, for your consideration, I have two items. Um, one is um, for you to consider a proposal of uh, acknowledging tribal partners during your board meetings. And the other piece of the conversation is a, um, uh, for you having a conversation whether the three minutes of public testimony is adequate, and I believe you'll want to facilitate that conversation today. <laughs> Included in your packet, and I don't know if Commissioner Edwards had the opportunity uh, to look at those proposals. You do you have in front of you that, Commissioner? Uh, could you, uh, the, what was that first item you said? Is a proposal language to acknowledge tribal partners during board meetings. Oh, okay. Uh, actually, I don't believe I have that. Did you, was it in the packet from yesterday? It is in the packet this morning. I, I I gave a copy to Robin early today, and I was hoping that she will share that with you. Okay. Okay. Well, I I so, don't believe I have. Okay. So let me job. let me. So Go I will ahead. read. I will read it out loud, and and okay. hope you can follow along. Okay. There is a, a proposal for you, for the board to consider actually making a formal acknowledgement <laughs> of tribal partners during the board meeting. <laughs> And I'm gonna and I'm gonna give you read the, the gist of this acknowledgement. We like to acknowledge the indigenous people who have lived on and cared for the land and waterways of this county since time immemorial, and uh, and who still inhabit uh, the area today, specifically the Squaxin Island, Nisqually, and Chehalis people our sovereign tribal partners. That is the gist of the, uh, of the proposed language. The options that I have for you, which is at the beginning of, of that paragraph, varies depending on where in the agenda you would like to consider, if, if, if approved, would like to in, insert this language. Option number one is, is, is before the Pledge of Allegiance, and option number two is after the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, if you like, I can provide my perspective as to where you should consider it, but um, I'd like to begin by uh, have the board discuss in this proposed language, as I read it. Okay. Uh, and I'll leave that up to the chair here to pick on either uh, my seatmate or I, I guess. Okay. Um, go ahead, Commissioner Edwards. Uh, I don't know that I'm particularly in favor of this because I don't know where we draw the line. Uh, I do think that we could certainly uh, ask any of those uh, elected officials from those tribes that want to be recognized to be present, and we would be glad to do something like that. But I don't know that it's, uh, I, I don't see the necessity of doing it. You're talking about doing this at every meeting that we open up? Yeah, that, that is the proposal, sir. Okay, well, I, I think it's gonna start getting complicated here. Pretty soon we're gonna have uh, different groups that feel uh, they maybe should be recognized too, and maybe they should be, I don't know. So. Where do we draw the line? I guess uh, I'm open to discussion on it, though. Commissioner Mejia, any thoughts about this? <clears throat> so with the land acknowledgement, um, I just want to get clarification on, is this just before the BOCC meeting? 
Like before yeah. or after the Pledge of Allegiance? Is that your proposal, Ramiro? So uh, option one and option two, that's what I attached to and, uh, on the packet, a, a, a copy of the first page of the agenda. In the option one, uh, when you see a Nicole uh, meeting to order, the first item is Pledge of Allegiance to the, um, indeed by the commissioner. Option one is to, if, if the board agrees, to include this language prior to the Pledge of Allegiance. And option two uh, is to include after the Pledge of Allegiance. My suggestion is for you for option two, but um, uh, but that's, first of all, if you like to, uh, first of all, uh, if the board agrees to include this language, and then you can probably discuss as to where. Yeah, so uh, for me, um, I don't know, I was, uh, in terms of a land acknowledgement, I was thinking of more of having kind of like a plaque um, or just something outside when you come into the buildings. Uh, there's kind of like a bulletin board uh, before you go and split up into building one, two, or three. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, and just having something big there um, with what the um, agreement actually is and having that land acknowledgement right there. Um, just, I feel like that would be in terms more meaningful um, than having a land acknowledgement at the beginning of every meeting. Um, and so I feel something more, I guess, permanent in a sense. Uh, would be great. I mean, I think just having an acknowledgement um, is really, it's good to start building relationships, but I'm, I don't know. I, I, I'm in favor of option two, uh, but I would like to see something a little bit more permanent that actually goes into the history of, of these tribes and, and having, you know, I, I, having their artwork around the building or having a section of, uh, with that, I feel that would be more meaningful. I, I have to say that sounds okay to me as an alternative. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know where do we, it's kind of like declaring an emergency for everything. I mean, I think a plaque would be great. Uh, maybe a historical uh, piece about the tribes that we want to recognize could go in that enclosed area there, recognizing uh, and, and let those folks come up with what is more important to them that they would like to have us acknowledge through the process laid out uh, by Commissioner Mejia. Okay, uh, that's a good idea, I think. Um, I looked at a, I kind of put this together looking, I looked at a whole bunch of uh, permutations of the language and I tried to keep this proposal as simple um, and straightforward as possible. Um, just to kind of avoid some of the pitfalls Commissioner Edwards is kind of getting at, like there's, there's a lot of stronger, more kind of, um, pointed statements about certain, you know, aspects that, you know, where the community may have differing points of view. And so I tried to sign it, keep this to a real basic statement of fact and respect and, and, and leave it at that. Um, the idea would be to answer Commissioner Mejia's question, only the 2 p.m., you know, the, only the, what are our formal kind of board meeting, where we do the pledge. I mean, we don't do the pledge of allegiance at every briefing and, you know, meeting that falls within the parameters of a regular meeting, but that's kind of our our showpiece meeting for the board's work each week. So that was the idea. Uh, I just wanted to hear uh, the, I guess nobody could stop me from saying what I want to say since I'm leading the meeting, but I really wanted to hear the board um, perspective on it. So um, maybe we can kind of just go ahead, Commissioner. Um, yeah. um Thank you for this. No, I, I think it's it's great. I mean, it really is. But um, 
is it something like we would switch off kind of like the Pledge of Allegiance where it would be, we would, or would, would it be something that you as the chair would do? What did you have in mind, chair? The, the idea was there'd be a Pledge of Allegiance and then I would simply, uh, uh, I would simply read the, this acknowledgement and then we'd move on to approve all the agenda. I mean, it would just be a, a piece, uh, kind of a setting the stage for the meeting, just like the, the Pledge of Allegiance does in a sense. Um, totally different thing or different reason for it. I'm not equating them, but um, in terms of format and, and how it's done, it would be just that simple, um, you know, and again, uh, yeah, go ahead, Commissioner Edwards. Yes, I think the chair's prerogative is to do what you think is proper myself. So I don't have any problem with that at all. I do wonder, I guess I'm not very woke, I guess. I guess that's a term some people use. And uh, I don't know. I, I just think the plaque has a meaning and it's permanent, you know. I don't know, then... I don't know, something happens to you, or, uh, I don't know, next week, you're not chair, <laughs> some of you get in a car wreck. Uh, does that mean that we would carry that on as a, as a traditional activity? I, I kind of like Commissioner Mejia's uh, suggestion, but I would not take away from your prerogative to do whatever you think is proper, but at some point, uh, I don't know, I, I, and I'm not trying to trivialize this whole thing, but you know, like now recently, I don't know, somebody's mad at Dr. Seuss and wants to burn his books or something. So where do you, where do you stop, I guess? And that's kind of where I'm at as far as different groups will come in that uh, maybe have been mistreated for whatever reason, maybe a long period of time. I don't know. Uh, I just kind of think a plaque but more more than a plaque, I guess, if we're going to do it, I would. That's where it would include the tribes, and if you could get the tribes to get along and come up with something they all agree on, I think it'd be fine. But uh, we're here on a beautiful piece piece of land here at our county courthouse, and you know, uh, before we were here, the the nations were in charge or who, however you want to refer to it. I don't know how they want to refer to it myself. So I, I think getting them involved is probably, uh, and seeing if we could come up with something that they would appreciate and think is appropriate would be a better way. And as far as whatever you want to say, I mean, either Commissioner uh, Mejia and I will alternate back and forth with the Pledge of Allegiance and then whatever you think is appropriate. I. I, I'm not trying to get in your business whatsoever, or, you know, I think that's your property. You are the chair. I, I appreciate that. And I wasn't necessarily saying that we make it a policy and bind all future board chairs to say it necessarily. It's it just something that could be the prerogative of the chair. I just wouldn't want to do it if I felt that the board, you know, because I, the chair kind of speaks for the board in that sense. And I would certainly not want to. I certainly wouldn't want to do that without respect for the, the, the full board's position. It sounds like there wouldn't be an objection to my using chair prerogative to make that statement if I, and I, I can think a little bit more about that, but is that is that okay with you, Commissioner Mejia? Yes, absolutely. And I, you know, I read over the message uh, once again, and I think it's, um, it's a good land acknowledgement. Um, and, and I think it's, it's good for us to start doing it, but I would want something a little bit more, I guess, <laughs> permanent for longer term. Um, I know I, I um, and I'll talk more about it, but um, I know the Nisqually tribe uh, spoke about maybe having a totem pole, an art pole uh, for each one of the tribes outside. And I thought that would be brilliant if, you know, what the tribes would be willing to do that. but. Um, I think this is great, and thank you for for bringing it up, Chair. Okay, well that sounds good. I'll, I'll we'll think through that, and I'm very amenable to your uh, idea as well of having something on campus. Um, 
Uh, Romero, anything we need to? No, what, what, what I'm hearing is uh, um, <clears throat> we'll go ahead and add option number two as part of the formal agenda. Uh, and, and I think we'll be uh, adequate to just have it on the agenda. And then uh, we will explore options, uh, whether it's a plaque or maybe coordination with the tribes, if a totem pole or any other uh, representation of, of, of the tribes may be adequate to place it in the courthouse. So I, I, what I got is a two-step process. Do we have to, I mean, I'm just asking, do we have to list it formally on the agenda? Can it be within the prerogative of the chair to, to say it or not say it or? Uh, my suggestion is, is to include it because the, the agenda is prescriptive. It's very prescriptive. Um, and, uh, so it doesn't come as a surprise to anybody. Okay. Well, we'll uh, could, could I comment on that? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't know that it needs to be on the agenda. I guess I don't understand exactly why. Uh, so Ty becomes very familiar with uh, the verbiage and whatever this statement is going to be and wants to do that. I do believe that's the chair's prerogative, but you're gone to something someday and then I have to get, uh, so, so I'm going to chair the meeting or, or Commissioner Mejia will be in that position at some point. Uh, I don't know about it being part of the agenda per se. I, I'd i like to see, is that kind of a common Robert's rules type of a thing to start cluttering up the agenda? That's all I'm, I'm wondering about. So I, I don't know as I agree with the county manager on this. I, I think I'll talk to the county manager offline and we can sort of figure that out because I don't necessarily think, I don't necessarily feel it has to be listed out um, yeah, but by the way, I wasn't suggesting to put the whole statement. It's just a no. line item. It, it will yeah, the line item it will be land acknowledgement. That, that that's all it is. Yeah. Well, then, it, but in that sense, then it's it's what Commissioner Edwards I think is getting at is then it kind of it's going beyond what we just said, which is that it would be sort of my prerogative right. as chair yeah. versus it being locked in and and you know. I don't show up that day. Well, now it's on the agenda. It has to be done versus, you know, versus something that, you know, I don't know. I, maybe just one other little follow-up. Uh, you know, for the recognizing the black community, for an example. So the Bush family came here and uh, very instrumental in our community. So should we add that in too? I, I don't know. I, I just think at some point we could get a little too carried away. That's all. I really do like the, the historical uh, display, though. I, and the totem pole. That, I like that. I think we ought to incorporate that into uh, something that would be kind of out on the point where we have a beautiful view of, of Olympia and and the Capitol and open that up and maybe have a little covered area out there. I don't know, some, something that is more meaningful, I guess, and something that the tribes are involved with. Okay. That's that's it for me. I'll, I'll, <clears throat> uh, I guess you can figure that out with the county manager chair. Okay, let's go to the Ramiro second uh, sub item under one, which is about public comment. Yeah, thank you. Um, I believe there is a, a, a there was a desire for the board to have a conversation related to uh, how many minutes uh, uh, you would like to allow for public testimony uh, for the public to come and, and give you their perspective during this meeting. At this point, is uh, is uh, what you have is three minutes. And uh, this doesn't need to be uh, codified in anything that's more operational, how the board like to manage this. So I'd like to bring this up to your discussion, considering that you have received some, <clears throat> a member of the public requesting that perhaps you may consider extending uh, the time 
for public um, for the opportunity for the public to address the board. I was going to make a suggestion. I'll just throw it out here. I, I had a, some email correspondence with Mr. Pettit. He's the one that you know had uh, had suggested this several times. My thought was this isn't this is not exactly what he's proposing. It's kind of my proposed compromise. My suggestion might be to try four minutes, uh, provided no more than five people are signed up or otherwise identified. Now, you know, we're doing hybrid right now. So basically, if five people or less are signed up, they get four minutes. That's a 20 minute cap block cap, so sort of on that section of the agenda. If more than five people are signed up or otherwise identified as testifying at the beginning of the period, then it, it just drops to three minutes. I want I, mean, I want it to be really clear. So, and you know, people come and prepare their statements, and they time themselves, and they write it out, and they and they. So I don't I don't think it should be too complex. I think it should be kind of as clear as I'm trying to balance being as clear and consistent as possible, but being mindful of our of our timing because unlike the council meetings that happen at night or the ours being in the afternoon are usually stacked, often stacked right before a Board of Health meeting, a transportation benefit district meeting, public hearings. So we do have kind of an extra incentive not to kind of let a meeting get out of hand, like some of our Board of Health meetings, frankly, had where the whole meeting got taken up by public comment. We weren't able to do the business we needed to do. So just being mindful of that, um, Mr. Pettit, for example, was he definitely agreed that 20 minutes kind of as a block was made sense uh, from his perspective. He was trying to advocate for well, what about five minutes if there's only you know a couple three people, but then you've got five, four, three, and I just think it gets sort of complicated um, if you just say if public comment is four minutes unless we've got more than five people and then it's three minutes. That happens once, frankly, in probably well in the pandemic it hasn't really happened at all. Even pre-pandemic, having more than five public comments happen maybe once a month. Um, so that's that's my thought on everything I've heard. Go ahead, Ramiro. Just to facilitate the conversation, Commissioner, uh, thank you for your, uh, your thoughts. Um, I, I probably encourage the board if if um, if you're considering extending the time for public testimony to just make it uh, even for all, because managing the number of uh, uh, members of the public. And then you will be adjusting how, many, how much time you, you allow for public testimony is going to be extremely difficult because in one week, you will allow a, a, a member of the public four minutes. And the following week, somebody will be allowed only three minutes. So uh, I don't think it's going to be, uh, 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 from my perspective, good for the, for the individuals who just happened to provide public testimony and they just happen to have more than five and they're in the room. I don't think that they, I don't think it will be a fair approach to that. Uh, so if the board considers to increase the time, might as well just do it uh, all at once, they, uh, at once, they applies to every meeting. That's just my suggestion. Commissioner Mejia, do you have any response to I think four minutes is a, is a good, a good place to start. Um, I think it's a really good middle point. Um, and just from my experience where we had a lot of comment, most people won't use those four minutes, so go way less than that, um, sometimes even under a minute. So um, sometimes people just want to make sure that they you know, that you know that they are there in support of a specific item. Um, but that's just from the short period of time where I've, I've been here and limited experience. So, but I think four minutes uh, on a uniform way, taking into account what uh, County Manager Chavez said, um, I think four minutes is, is a good place to start, but I'm not sure if you have any thoughts on that, Chair or Commissioner Edwards. Well, my own, uh, you know, let me just respond to that because the, I will say, and you know, that you haven't seen, like the board meetings with, in this pandemic environment have been very different 
than a regular, um, you know, and we do get far fewer folks chiming in for public comment um, overall over the last year than, than we will once we're back to having open board meetings, just whatever, for whatever that's worth. Go ahead, Commissioner Edwards. I, uh, I think I'm, I'm inclined to uh, go along with the recommendation that uh, Commissioner Mejia and the county manager made, only for the simplicity of it uh, initially. And, and then if that's not working, we can always revisit it. But I, I think it's a, a fair way to try to make an accommodation to get information to the board. So that's, I, I like to have the community feel that we're paying attention and listening to their concerns. And I don't think four minutes is out of the line. I do think though, when we give uh, the, the warning, if you will, uh, up to four minutes, make sure they know they're not obligated by any stretch of the imagination. I don't know, because so many people, some people come and they really get tongue tied when they get in front of that mic. And that's just normal, I think. Uh, and just let them know that, you know, we're here to listen to your concerns and uh, you've got up to four minutes, don't need to use it all. You know, encourage them maybe to keep it short and sweet. Anyway, otherwise, with, I, I'm kind of there with uh, Commissioner Mejia for, for a review of the process and see how it goes. Okay, well, I, I think it's gonna be fine uh, for the rest of the pandemic. So we can start with that. It sounds like you got three commissioners wanting to try an expansion and two that two votes for a, just a flat four minutes with no other rule. So that sounds like where we're going to start. And then yep. once the uh, meetings transition back, we may have to revisit it, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Yeah, and you can change this in any time, uh, absolutely. And also uh, just for the benefit of the viewing public, uh, the four minutes that now you approve to allow it on public testimony, that's, that's not the only way, means, and method in which the public can provide public testimony or feedback to the board. Uh, the board can, uh, the public, members of the public can make a, an appointment to individual commissioners. Members of the public can submit emails, which more, a lot of individuals do that and the commissioners read those emails and we respond accordingly. So this is just one window within the formal meeting. The, uh, the public has the opportunity to address the board, but there is other methods uh, the citizens can engage the board uh, uh, to make sure they hear their perspective. I would just say that email sometimes, I mean, I don't get a chance to respond directly to people that come into the boardroom and test give testimony. And I can't say that I respond to every single email because sometimes we get a big block from a group and it's kind of a form email or and such and such. But you are highly likely to get a response directly from me from a, to an email, and you're not going to get that same interaction if you come to the boardroom because we don't. We, that's just not right. how we're structured. We don't have time to do the back and forth. Right. I, I may take down your name and. Um, respond back to you. I do that sometimes, but it's more frequent that I would just directly email you back. So that's a good way to interact with uh, the commissioner. Okay. Does that cover us for item one? Yeah. Yeah, yes, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Item two is report on external boards and commissions. We'll start with Commissioner Mejia this morning. Yeah, so uh, I've been attending just my boards yesterday. I had intercity transit. Um, and then I also had uh, JASCOM on Monday. Um, I started my inner city transit uh, ITA orientation last Friday. Um, and I, we went through the operations, administration, and also the grants financial part of it. I'm very thankful to the staff who took the time to really walk me through the process. I have the second half of the orientation, usually it's done in one day, but uh, now due to the pandemic, it's split up uh, in two parts, uh, will be this Friday. So I'm excited about that and see what else I learn. Um, I did the pathway career exploration uh, with uh, Yelm High School 
on this last Friday. Uh, thank you to our PIOs for helping me uh, do a video and um, help uh, get it set up. Um, it was in a bilingual format, English, Spanish. So I, I'm very excited uh, and thank you again to Commissioner Edwards for um, leading them my way. Um, another thing we did was um, we had a COVID-19 vaccine forum um, on Monday uh, with several of our community organizations. Um, it was a really good com beginning of a conversation, uh, but uh, it was apparent to me that uh, many of these community leaders wish to continue having these, com uh, these communications. I think it's an efficient way to communicate uh, to our uh, public uh, who use their services and, and maybe don't have access to technology um, to really continue uh, building those partnerships and seeing how we can really support each other and keep working as a community as we get through this whole vaccination process. I also met with the Nisqually Tribe Council last week and it was, I'm very humbled by the conversation we had um, and I really continue, uh, I'm looking forward to continue working with them. Um, they do want to meet with all of the commissioners. So I know um, Sarah will be reaching out to uh, all of the assistants and um, also with, uh, so we can all go and, and meet with their council um, and see how we can really continue to work and, and keep partnering together. Um, but one of the things that they really said, they, they really want to work with the county. They um, want to um, be a part in, in several ways. Uh, one of them is through bring, bringing their art and history uh, here into the county halls, which I'm very excited about. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about continuing those conversations and seeing how we can keep building on that relationship. Uh, and that is all for me. Thank you. Questions for Commissioner Mejia? I'm trying to think. I, I'm just curious if you could say any more about your Nisqually meeting in terms of what subjects you guys covered or what they were interested in talking about. Yeah, I'll do one last minute. I took a lot of notes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just very, um, I know we talked a lot. Uh, one of the things we talked about is how they want to be a part of the Law and Justice Council. Um, oh. I thought that was very interesting. Um, and so I think they, they are a part of it. We've been trying to get them to uh, get, not just them, but all the, we're trying to get the tribal members to attend. And I'm glad to hear that they're interested in that. Yes, so that, that was one of the things they did say to me. Um, they have a, couple projects that they're going to have um, and they said that they will uh, talk about just those future projects in terms of, of what they're planning to build and, and um, in, in terms of, of uh, buying land and, and building and um, so that's that's one of the, the things I know they have a project in regards to the I-5 congestion and the impact on the estuary um, they did offer that to uh, give me a little tour on a can canoe. So I'm really excited about that to, to head over that way. Um, they have a health clinic uh, dedicated mainly for elders that is being built. And they are building around 40 to 50 houses. So they are basically in that project trying to provide enough housing for their tribal members. Um, they uh, would like to uh, get in touch with the historical committee because they would like to do kind of um, a, a history, an informational, uh, basically in regards to, to their history, maybe just on a pamphlet or uh, a little packet um, or just ways where they can start relaying their history out more. Um, let's see. Um, I did speak to them about uh, some of the work that we were doing in regards to um, declaring racism a 
uh, a crisis here in Thurston County and how um, Ramiro was looking into um, building the um, human, uh, is it the, what is it Ramiro? It's the cultural and. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> re-engineering the uh, Cultural Diversity and Human Rights Council. Yes. Yeah. And so um, I spoke with them a little bit about how Ramiro is, 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 is trying to make sure that um, it's very active here in the county in, in regards to the policies. And they also said they would like to, to definitely be a part of that conversation going forward. So I was very happy to hear that, that they really do want to be an active partner with us. Um, but that's just some of the things we, we talked about that I was very excited about. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Edwards. I think as far as of note, the things that, uh, as far as that report on committee assignments, the, the biggest thing was uh, last night our uh, communications board met and uh, the cell tower that we finally got up is going to be very beneficial to providing that emergency services coverage in that particular area. It's not online yet. But the tower itself is up and I did talk to the folks that were constructing the tower and they said it usually takes about a month for the cell company to get up and running after they've finished their job. So I'm assuming it's going to happen fairly well, fairly quick. Uh, the Nisqually River issue, uh, we had kind of an anomaly happen with the levels as shown on the computer for flood concern. Uh, we think that was probably some kind of uh, technical error rather than a real issue. Working on that, you know, flood control, it's not an issue certainly now because uh, we've had seemed to have pretty dry weather. But I can tell you, I get uh, pretty constant contact about that. And Kurt Harding deals with it pretty well. Uh, I don't think I really have anything of substance. I mean, I've been made fair. Fair was last, fair board was last night. Uh, I know that we're doing a vaccination uh, coming up out there, and they're actually we're actually renting the fairground a little bit because they're not able to have revenue coming in, and that is a valid expenditure of some of our CARES money and when we rent space. So that's helping them out, and they're looking forward to to that process. And we don't know if the fair is going to be or not yet. So maybe it'll be a virtual fair. Anyway, I really don't have any hot issues to pass on to my seatmates about this stuff. Okay. Um, as far as my board and commission, uh, the only thing that I would report related to well, there's kind of a continuum. So I'll start with the most formal. I, I am the representative now on the Capitol Lake Executive Committee. And in order to kind of educate me about that, they, the, the consultant and the DEA, the state, the kind of leaders of the team had an orientation with me and Jeff Gadman, who's our, obviously our county treasurer, but he represents us on the, on the funding and, and uh, or what's it called? The, Finance and governance work group, I think it is. That's yeah, the yeah subgroup. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess Jeff had missed part of a meeting, and because of that, and because I was new, we just kind of had a small Zoom uh, to try to get every everybody to speed. And of course, the board heard about this through Hutch last year, but Commissioner Mejia has, maybe hasn't heard about it at all. <laughs> it's kind of complicated, but they tried to they tried to get the parties to kind of agree on a structure for, for financing. Um, and without going into detail on that, I think the jurisdictions pushed back, including Thurston County, in terms of 
we don't really know what the project is, so it's hard to say. Just first of all, it's hard to figure out how much the county is responsible for for maintaining maintenance costs anyway, and really hard to figure that out when we don't even know what the project exactly looks like. There's two pieces of this, uh, just kind of as an orientation. There's the upfront construction cost for reconfiguring the, you know, the the Capital Lake Estuary, and then there's ongoing maintenance, sediment management, and et cetera. And those are being treated kind of differently. Um, there seems to be general consensus that at least by the other by the local jurisdictions that the state needs to bear the great majority of the burden for the first piece, which is the construction up front, because they structured this to kind of the way the way it is to begin with. And um, but then there the state's really pushing back on the local jurisdictions to come up with some commitments about ongoing maintenance. And anyway, so that got all deferred basically. Um, the net result of that is it's being it's going to be deferred until there's at least some somewhere closer to a recommended alternative, which is going to come from the EIS process. We're going to get a draft in late June. That's just going to be the preliminary data. Then it's going to go through like another year process of analysis. It's not going to be till mid 2022 that a quote unquote preferred alternative is going to be identified by group. So lots of opportunity to chew on the information that we get in June. Now, all that is kind of the background to the, what the meeting was about that I was part of, and that's this table, which is kind of what Jeff's been working, uh, part of what Jeff's been working on, which is a governance model. So how, what kind of structure would, would manage the ongoing governance of this? And they kind of created a table with all the different possibilities uh, special purpose district, a public development authority, a just a contractual agreement, a nonprofit organization, or a, they call J Musa, a joint municipal utility authority. That's a big one because they have their own independent taxing authority. So uh, they put together kind of like uh, a table, costs and benefits, ins and outs. Uh, they got somebody from the attorney general's office to weigh in with comments on this table as to each one of these. What the what the considerations might be from the state's attorney general office. Um, so this is kind of something that I was given to chew on, and it's going to be something that um, I guess we're going to discuss at the next meeting uh, here coming up in June for the executive committee. The state folks would the the, the leadership would like to push us to discuss this and maybe identify one or two models that could then be fleshed out further. So they'd like us to winnow this list down. Um, so I'll give it to Ramiro. Um, it's pretty, it's just a one pager really, but it's a lot of information packed into this Excel table in terms of, and I don't have, I, I can tell you I have literally no opinion or agenda about it. Um, it's complex and I'm not sure what the right answer is. So just giving you all of that information and you can take a look at it. I'm going to go over it with Jeff on a separate. I meet with Jeff Gadman monthly, and I'm going to make this a topic of our next meeting so he can share a little more of what he's learned over the last year. Um, the chair, okay. could I ask you something about that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, have they made any determination of which way this thing is headed with the lake as far as uh, an estuary, a uh, uh, hybrid? lake estuary any of that coming to pass yet not really that's what I, that's the preferred alternative which they're basically saying we're not going to see that until 2022 but in the meetings i've sat in on and this is just off the record i i hadn't i have not heard a lot of stakeholder um support for the status quo I think in, uh, a complete natural estuary or a hybrid option, to me, it's just my read on the room, so to speak. It's gonna land in one of those two places. And I think this data that we're gonna get in June might help us determine, I'm hoping it will be specific enough to help us determine how viable a hybrid option is. My sense of it is that ecologically, a hybrid could work, but the hybrid is gonna require more cost to maintain over the long term. So it's a question of, do we wanna pay 
is a, is a small reflecting pool valuable enough to the community that we want to pay the higher cost for it? That's going to be a conversation for the community to, to have. I need to see the dollars and cents. I mean, the reflecting pool sure is nice, and as long as it's ecologically sound, I'm open-minded about it, but we need to see what it's going to cost and who's going to be responsible for managing it. Uh, is the port in, involved in this as well? The port has a seat at the, in the executive committee, uh, yes. Uh, did anything said at all about this snail or some kind of invasive yeah. species or something? Well, Jeff brought that up. Apparently that was a topic from the meeting that he had missed. And so he brought it up and I wasn't completely tracking, but Jeff had a bunch of questions about the snail, whether or not. So what the consultant said was that complete eradication is not assumed and they call decon stations, decontamination stations. So the snail will, the snail will still, uh, so the snail, if the, um, the snail, I guess is fresh water. I, want, I hope I'm getting this right. And if the reflecting pool is mostly salt water, the snail could still survive in areas near shoreline, near the shore where ground, where fresh groundwater is coming into the system. And there would still need to be decon these decon stations. I don't even really know what that means, but there would still need to be management of the snail, even uh, under any permutation is assumed. So that's, I don't know exactly what all that means, but that's what I got out of the questions that Jeff had. Okay, I guess sounds like more to come on the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, more to come. There hasn't even been an executive committee meeting. This was kind of prepping me for the first one that will happen, I think, in June. Okay. Did uh, are all your meetings? I take it are Zoom now for now anyway, huh? Yeah, that was a Zoom. Okay. Thanks. That's Capital Lake. Um, another meeting I wanted to report on, just for the board's benefit. Um, Ramiro and I attended. This is actually just a uh, a meeting that was set up that I meet with the prosecutor and the sheriff and the public defense, and we invited Diane Whaley, who is involved in the Community Court of Olympia because uh, the, what, what had happened is that the, the prosecutor, Judge John Thunheim, had been con contacted by the Olympia Municipal Court Judge, Scott All, about their plans to move. They really want to be out of the old Lee Creighton Justice Center at Plum and Union and expand their ability to have their community court function better. And they are looking at spaces. They were looking at the old firehouse downtown. They looked over at 3000 Pacific, uh, which is you know that, uh, that building that's being remodeled. And I guess I'm just laying this out here. Nothing's set in stone, but they're looking to move into a bigger space. And they just wanted us to know that in case it, were, it would happen to align with you know, moves and, and things that, that we're doing, whether it's resource hub or, or court space or whatever. So, I'm just sharing that with the board so that you can keep it in your mind as we have space discussions that Olympia is also needing and wanting to move. And, um, you know, you know, Olymp so district court, our district court handles Tumwater and Lacey's municipal courts by contract and then Olympia municipal court being separate. There's a synergy there if, if those were ever co-located under any permutation of, of, uh, of, uh, of decisions that we could make. So there's that. And then I guess the third thing I'll report on, I think Commissioner Mejia has heard this. Commissioner Edwards, you probably know all about it, but I don't think they've had a chance to meet with you, but it was a meeting about from the Lake Lawrence and Lake Management District, and they wanted to engage the board in a conversation about the interfund charges. And they have a lot of information that they presented, and I'd like to I'd like the board to kind of hear from um, from our staff at an appropriate time, whenever that would be, about that and what the options are for helping Lake Management District be more successful. I guess is the goal. Commissioner Mejia, you're nodding. Did you did you uh, did you have a similar reaction to their proposal? Or I... yes. So, so thank you for bringing this up. I actually had it on my list uh, to talk with County Manager Chavez after at our check-in, um, but it, it's definitely something I'm really interested more in 
and learning and specifically um, I know we're doing a, a fees assessment and um, I, I was wondering if that was going to fall if those fees were going to fall into that and the conversation uh, that I had was was very insightful and let me know uh, much more about the lake uh, management districts um, and really uh, how invested the people that live around those lakes are. Um, so thank you for bringing that up, Chair. Commissioner Edwards, are you familiar with this, um, this, this sort of uh, complaint, I'll call it, um, of lake management districts about the inner fund charges? Yes, and uh, I think it boils down to uh, they don't, feel they're getting a fair shake. I'll, I guess I'll just put it that way uh, for a number of different reasons. But I think the whole lake management process, we should have a discussion on that at some point in time. And the reason I say that, the lake residents and those on back lots that have access to the lake through their community associations are really footing the bill on trying to keep these lakes as healthy as they possibly can. But if you think about the lake usage uh, with, with public accesses on the lakes, it I think they're doing the work of the public because the public is really the one that they're the group that really uses the lake activity more than than the lake residents themselves. I think they the residents have the aesthetics of of maybe living near the water type of a thing. But boy, in the summertime, those lakes are really used quite heavily and probably contributing to the overall health of the lake. And it seems like they end up handling the brunt of what they can do with very limited resources. And they don't seem to get any help from the state. And the state claims ownership of the lakes, but they don't seem to be interested in coming up with the solution, whether it's uh, excessive nutrient in the lake with the algae problem and uh, we seem to be having more uh, toxic algae issues, and those kind of things that are restricting access to the lakes. I'd like to have that be a discussion very much like what we're doing with Capital Lake uh, to a degree. I mean, not necessarily to the same, same level, but I think the folks living on or near those lake management districts uh, feel they're handling the brunt of the problem and not getting uh, much help from the county. Now, I know there's adjustments on, I don't know, stormwater runoff rates and things like that that go into this, but I'm not sure that they're actually even coming close to covering. Those, those groups are taxing themselves quite heavily to deal with this problem. And I, I just think there is uh, more to come on it. And I'd like to have, I'd like to have a, a meeting where the three of us can be sitting there listening to the lake management people actually present their concerns and maybe have some county staff there at the time rather than two separate meetings, for an example. Uh, I'd like to have them included in the discussion. So that's my perspective, I guess, on that. Ramiro, what do you think about, have you heard the, about this issue? Oh, I, I have a lot of history in this issue, Commissioner. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, and there is uh, a lot of history. I'll be more than happy to provide you when the time comes. And that uh, related to internal rates, also there is a lot of history, particularly with uh, uh, Lawrence, uh, Lake Lawrence. And it's related specifically to equipment. And, and, and I, I, I would love to take the board back in history 
as to how some of the different steps that we, that we have and uh, that we have taken related to, and just to give an example, uh, the Lake Management District, uh, Lawrence Lake, used to own a vehicle. It was exclusively used to uh, manage their operations. Three years ago, they, uh, they requested to that to be removed because they have issues as to how much money the Lake Management District was putting into the ERNR, that's the equipment and replacement. So that was taken uh, off of uh, their, uh, they, uh, so they don't own a vehicle and that was the direction of the board at that time. But at the same time, we need to charge the Lake Management Districts for the usage of equipment the county utilizes to provide their operations. And I believe at this point, those rates seems to be not adequate from their perspective. The, the internal rates are not adequate. They, it, it, we, we tried the FEMA rates, the internal rates, even on the internal rates, there is an issue. It is an issue because we don't have specifically some specific equipment such as the trailer and the boats as to how we need to charge them. And that is the, I, I believe that is probably some of the conversations that we need to have. Uh, they think they, they, the rates are not adequate, but at the same time, the county cannot subsidize a particular group unless the county, the commissioners would like to really take a budgetary action to include a general fund to subsidize some of, some of the activities. And the board data took an action to subsidize that two years ago on the, on the, on the Lake Lawrence. I think it was before you, Commissioner Menser. Where specifically, the, the, the board took an action to add general fund money to mitigate some of their uh, budget concerns. And that's within your purview. Absolutely within your purview as to how you want to manage that. But there's a lot of more history behind this and I'll be more than happy to elaborate when the time comes. And again, I don't wanna to go too deep into it because I think we need to have that normal conversation, but just what I was, what they presented this morning, they're doing public records requests for every budget of every lake management district in the state. They've said there's 17 lake management districts and we're the only one that charges the inner fund. They showed, they've got a spreadsheet. They said, they showed that the majority of, of lake management districts don't charge anything for that. And a couple that do, it's only about the assessor collecting the assessment. There's a small charge from two different counties for assessor costs, but we're the only one that kind of gives the whole kit and caboodle. And, and again, I'm not saying it's illegitimate to do it, but if it's not allowing the lake management districts to be successful, it just may not be a sustainable yeah. structure. We just need to look at that because the argument is if we lose the lake management district or if other ones aren't forming, we're costing ourselves the money. You know, we pay 100% of the cost to manage lakes if they don't have a district. So not losing the district saves us money, which we have to think about in terms of offsetting the, what, what you're calling a subsidy. I don't know the answer, but it's a calculation that probably needs to be discussed. Before. Yeah, and, and I, uh, I've heard the other counties don't charge internal rates, but you know, it's hard to, to determine how the counties form those districts in the past. So it's, it's really just comparing at the bottom line number may not necessarily be the case. But also as an alternative, and, and I believe the Lake Management Districts understand this, they can vote themselves to become a special use district. Similar to the Black Lake, the special use district, where they really, whatever taxation they like to implement themselves, they have the oversight themselves as to how they operate that. They, they, that's also an option they, they, two of the Lake Management Districts have. They don't have to, mm -hmm. You know, uh, that just and they don't get they don't get assessed the inner fund because we're not we're not supporting them. Is that correct? Right. So and and that when, for instance, the special the Black Lake Special Use District, as you know, the 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 Board of County Commissioners just took an action because they wanted to go ahead and and, and secure a bond and increase the fees, but that was just administrative legislative action. But the, the, the county does not have any operational oversight over the special use district. Uh, they're self-sufficient. And that is also an option for the two lake management districts that we have. But, you know, we'll could I, could, no. yeah, ahead, could I comment on that? Uh, I think the county manager is, you know, kind of hit it on the head earlier when he said that we 
could fund general fund activity to help solve that problem. Because Chair, you were right on. If, if these Lake Districts break down and are not able to accomplish their mission, then who's going to pick it up? Who's going to take care of the lakes? Well, then it all gets dumped on the county because I tell you, there will be a lot of pressure brought to bear to fix those situations. I would much rather help those lake uh, management districts be successful in their endeavors, which in turn benefits all the citizens of the county that are using those lakes, uh, whether it's for fishing or recreation or whatever it is. So that's why I want to step forward with some funding to help them become successful. I don't think it's going to take an arm and a leg. Uh, might take a hand, I don't know, hand out, hand <laughs> up, something like that. But I really do think that we should think about uh, not being, not not trying to hold them back, trying to help them is the way I look at it. Because if we expend a little money now and they continue to, to do what they need to do, because it's for the benefit of the public. And I think that's what we're in office for, is to benefit the public. And, and so I think that's a discussion we need to have. So uh, just uh, this uh, additional clarification, uh, just reminded the board, the uh, Thurston County has many 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 lakes, 108, and 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 the county is not in any shape or form obligated to deal with water quality of any of the lakes outside of the lake management districts. I just want to provide that perspective. Okay, I guess I need to follow up on that, Chair. Can I? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm just going to talk about the reality of being in public office and being elected to that public office. I can tell you that if we end up in a situation where we've got mud holes, we're gonna be involved from a political standpoint. If you wanna get elected to office, you better commit to helping do something. I'm just saying down the road in the future, and I wanna stay ahead of this problem as much as I can. I don't wanna wait until the problem uh, turns everything upside down. So that's kind of where I'm at. Toxic algae has drug our public health department into lake management scenarios and closures and whatnot that don't involve lake management district and we're spending money to deal with that. So I think I agree with commissioner. Commissioner, you sounded like my wife is saying, um, uh, it sounded like you're saying we need to spend money to save money. And that's what I was yeah, well, I. I think that might be it. It's going to develop into something later on if we don't. Yeah. Okay, let's go to item three, which is just kind of our random commissioner items, not necessarily related to boards or commissions, anything that might need to be addressed. We don't get any other opportunity to, to bring up. Uh, commissioner Mejia, do you have anything on your list of that character? So I know that we talked in regards to meeting times. Um, and just looking back at our history, I think um, and I know it's really hard right now during the pandemic, but maybe just doing something where um, we're going to our different jurisdictions um, and really, I think, trying to approach the public, get more public comment from, from those areas. And really, um, I mean, if it means going down to, um, you know, the Rainier City Hall and, and just uh, attending there and accepting public comment. I, I don't know, just um, maybe doing that um, or a, a meeting after hours uh, in each of the jurisdictions, maybe quarterly or, or um, I don't, just in different ways to become more accessible to, um, you know, the people that we are representing and really hear from, um, from all of them. Um, I would like to have or go more in, more in depth and with that conversation later on, uh, if possible. So, on two. So, uh, as to, I, I think I think the board shares your um, your interest there. 
as to going to other places, we had we have something set up and we were implementing it before COVID-19 kind of disrupted us. We had a, a Lacey Farm Bureau meeting, we had a Rochester meeting, and, right. and that's something that I think we'll start back up as soon as we can. In terms of an evening meeting, I think the proposal that we're gonna be discussing later today has a proposal in yeah, there. Yeah, it, it, it is a proposal. You will discuss in the board meetings in an executive session this afternoon. So both of those I think will be addressed. Um, yeah. At that time, Ramiro, anything else to say about that item? No, no I, I, uh, I just want to make sure that you have the ability to have that conversation uh, in an executive session this afternoon. And uh, uh, th th these two items, among many others, will be discussed. And, and, and at that point, you will have the opportunity to provide direction, not a decision, because the decision has to be made through a public process. Uh, just looking for somewhat a, a, a direction. If that is the case, then we'll move the proposal forward for the public to provide testimony before you actually take a formal action. All right, uh, Gary, did you have anything that you needed to say on that one? No, not on that. Uh, I guess I would like to ask about an issue though. Okay, we'll just go around the horn. So I'll go to Commissioner uh, Edwards, and then we can circle back. On our, uh, the racism issue, as far as the, the public health issue, have we got situations that we know of? I mean, Ty, I, I don't think you and I probably have ever faced any racism, I guess. I mean, that's kind of the way... I, I've never seen it. I was in the military with a lot of uh, mixed race activity. I never saw it there. And they're pretty strict about that kind of stuff. But uh, I'm, I'm curious. We're talking about this proclamation. But if we're recognizing that it is a problem, do we have any examples? And, and maybe Commissioner Mejia can, can comment on that a little bit better than either of us might be able to. But like I say, I haven't really faced anything. I mean, I, I know that I've been in uh, minority bars or something like that or minority events. And and I think it's human nature. People look at you if you're a stranger. <laughs> so I, I know that it happens. Uh, but if we do have racism, I'd like to do something about it if we're aware of it other than just talk about it through a proclamation. I mean, if, if we're aware that, especially in government, I can't believe that uh, as a manager of public employees for many, many years, uh, we never tolerated any type of racism that I was aware of. And if I was made aware of it, I'm sure we dealt with it. So have we got something out there that I'm missing the boat on? Uh, uh, some particular entity or group or within county government? Do we have a problem or are we just talking about preventive maintenance, so to speak? I'm just curious. Uh, I, I'd like to probably maybe Commissioner Mejia would have more knowledge about it. Maybe she's been here five years now. Am so, I putting you on the spot, <laughs> Commissioner? <laughs> um, so yeah, we do have a problem. Um, okay. And I've spoken with many people who have worked, um, many staff members uh, of color who have worked uh, in other counties and have come here and, and they've expressed their concern. Um, and so, you know, sometimes uh, racism is not uh, very, I mean, it's not uh, like they're wearing a sign uh, with, a, der a derogatory term or anything like that, but uh, sometimes it's in small actions, uh, small things you say um, that disregard someone's, um, you know, color, background, um, culture. Um, so there, there are, and I think the the point of the proclamation was to actually put in action plan in place to see, to audit where we are and where we can move forward. And that's what I, uh, the idea that I got for, from this is, um, 
seeing how we can just continue to, to better ourselves um, and really improve uh, on our policies. Um, and again, sometimes it's, it's not something that, um, you know, if, if you've never experienced it, it's not out in the open, but there are certain policies that do affect um, our, our BIPOC community or our BIPOC staff here, especially. Let me give an okay. example. Thank you. Here of the um, like, and, and I and I do believe that there are, like, um, I do believe there are direct instances of racism. So I don't want my comments to be taken as if there aren't. But a lot of what we're what we're battling against is subconscious. And let me give an example of this. Berkeley, California, which has been a liberal bastion of policy making for decades and decades. And I know their police, I used to live there because I went to law school there, and I know their police department is very tightly controlled uh, in terms of, you know, being progressive and being open-minded and being trained in diversity and equity. So even in Berkeley, they found statistically that when police were pulling people over for uh, minor violations like a tab fired or a crack in the taillight or whatever, seven times, six or seven times more they were pulling over people of color for those minor things than white people. Now, the if you ask the officer, you know, that person did that thing. So the officer would say, well, I saw a crack in the taillight. You know, I pulled that person over. But they're not pulling over people at the same rates. And it's probably subconscious. They probably, it's just kind of an embedded it's an embedded cultural stereotype of what they grew up thinking a, a criminal profile looks like. But the, but the net effect of that is that people are being harassed because of their skin color in a way that is just not appropriate. And the officers are, are not probably doing it consciously. In Berkeley, I can guarantee you they're not. Um, but Berkeley decided that they're just going to eliminate the ability for officers to stop people on for those tiny minor technical violations because it just hasn't been proven that it can be done in a race neutral fashion. So those are the kind of situations that we're, we're up against. And, you know, um, I, I think we've come a long way in battling the kind of, in, in terms of Thurston County and Washington and the Western states, we never had the embedded you know, stuff that ha has happened in the East and the South, but We've come a long way, but um, there's still a lot of subconscious, uh, institutionalized racism that has to be um, rooted out of our of our culture. Okay, I'm just asking the question. Um, I just uh, I thought if we had an, a, a real example, uh, and I guess that is an example that you just gave. I hope I hope that's not happening with us, but I guess it certainly could be. Yeah, and like there's statistics, and you know, statistics are can have other statistics, like you know, for example, blacks are four percent of the population and thirteen percent of the jail population, or the health outcomes that we saw at Thurston Drive saw that you know mortality rates and things. And there can be other explanations for for those things, but they're definitely red flags that you have to look at carefully. Romero, you had something. Yeah, uh, uh, for your consideration, there is two items uh, related to this uh, issue that Commissioner Edwards uh, brought up. Is the resolution uh, that you might be considered as part of your Board of County Commissioners in a proclamation at the Board of Health is two uh, instruments the Board will be considering. And related to, um, they said the numbers, and uh, Commissioner Messi uh, uh, touched base on that, on the proposed resolution that um, that I introduced to the board uh, this past Tuesday that I asked you to review it, include some, some numbers. And let me read you this a little bit. Uh, Thurston County residents, the life expectancy uh, overall is 81 years old. But Native Americans' life expectancy in Thurston County is 72 years old. Native Hawaiians in Pacific Island are 73 years old. An African American is 78 years old. The infant mortality in Thurston County for African-American babies is 9.9%. Hispanics at 4.8% versus as a whole in the county is only 4.4%. <laughs> there could be many reasons behind that as Commissioner Messer stated, but certainly it's indicators 
indicates what I perceive to be a systemic uh, racism that it doesn't materialize on a company, it doesn't materialize in a single action. It is more in the system as a whole that perhaps uh, uh, that we need to start addressing as a government. I'm going to jump in with a commissioner item. So I know the board all got um, copies of the letter from the Nisqually River Council. And it was asking for us to do some testing of um, recycled asphalt areas in other parts of Thurston County. And I just, um, it, without going too deep into this, I just wanted to call attention, the board's attention to the last sentence of the second paragraph. You may not have this letter in front of you, but I'll read it. Because it relates to that, I, I think the reason, one of the motivations why we got this letter may be related to a, an item I reported on a few weeks ago about the tire, the tire um, chemical oxidizer that was found to uh, affect coho salmon. And uh, the last sentence here says, in addition to testing soil and groundwater for contaminants, the NRC sees this as an opportunity to test whether RAP, recycled asphalt, is a source of QPPD quinone. That's the chemical, a tire derived chemical, which new research has found to be extremely lethal to coho salmon and is present in local waters. So the letter was kind of detailed and I thought that the board might have skipped over that, but I just wanted to connect those dots. I'm guessing that that is the concern is that we've got, we've got this new knowledge that um, this tire chemical is affecting coho salmon. And, you know, when you're chewing up uh, old, old asphalt, you know, you could have, that could be a source of that chemical getting into water. So it's, the request was for us to do testing and I have no idea what that would involve or cost or I, I'm not trying to derail the decision the board made last fall, but it is a water quality it, uh, issue that, I, that I'd be curious to know what the county's capacity is to kind of look at that issue and maybe contribute to the regional understanding of, of, of how that tire chemical is getting into water and killing the, the coho. Just a good thought. I have a follow up on that. Yeah, go ahead, Gary. Uh, I have no problem at all with uh, trying to figure this out and see if, if to what degree the problem exists. And I was under the impression that they were kind of concerned about where we do have wrap stored, uh, that we kind of check under the wrap. I guess where it's been exposed to rainwater and such, and see if there is more toxicity, if that's what we're referring to on that particular chemical or yeah. product they're referring to that's damaging to coho, I guess. But maybe there's more information. I've only read one article about it, and that was that this uh, product in tires seems to be breaking down and it gets in washes off the side of the road and then that works its way into the environment and is damaging to the coho specifically coho i don't know why it doesn't affect trout or yeah. chum or whatever else you know I, I don't know anything about that but i would just like to have more knowledge about that particular information or maybe there's not enough knowledge yet to give out maybe that was just a Boy, this is brand new, so we're going to tip you, the public, off that, you know, this is an issue we have to start paying attention to. I'd like to hear more from the state because uh, the state has to be following this pretty close because they did have that litigation about culvert removing uh, issues with the tribes. And the idea is to make a he healthier environment for fish in general. But I don't know if specifically coho are part of that, but I would assume they are, and and see where uh, the Endangered Species Act uh, folks are coming with that. I mean, certainly, I don't want to reinvent the wheel if they've got some of this uh, research already available, and 
change. So I don't know that they do or they don't. I, I like I say, I've only read one article on it. Maybe Commissioner, uh, you've read more. I guess I don't know, but I, I'd like to have no, more information. And and I'm not at all adverse to testing under those wrap piles and see if that is part of the problem. But I just don't know what that's going to entail. I, I don't even know what we're looking for. And uh, would we do that through a contract or is the state already doing that or is the uh, federal or the federal folks doing it yet? I don't know. It can't be just an issue that Thurston County is concerned about. It's got to be a na national and maybe worldwide issue, I suppose. So just my well, comments. Yeah. I mean, I think you and I are in agreement that there's that. I mean, I think that the issue is now we know what we're looking for, or at least we know one thing we really are would be very curious to find because this is this is hot off the press research from uh, just the last few months of of, di of identifying this this very damaging chemical and seeing what it does to the fish. So um, I don't know the answer as to how many like is Thurston County unique in having these different our uh, recycled asphalt piles or is this something that any county could be doing or the state could be doing. Um, I'm not sure why the Muscali River Council is focused on our piles, maybe just because they're here and they know we have these piles. Um, but I guess I'm also I'm also interested in what um, what might be done to um, use whatever resources we have to um, to see if there's contributions we can make to the to this understanding. I don't know. Commissioner Mejia, any thought about that letter? Um, you weren't here for the whole recycled asphalt. Uh, <laughs> I know, was thing. not. Hot. Been on for years. Um, so, you know, if it's something that both you and Commissioner Edwards uh, have agreement on, then I'm happy to follow along. Let me uh, let me reach out to environmental health and see if, uh, if, if we can explore opportunities. Is is there any chance when you ask that question, uh, Romero, that you could find out what those folks know that maybe we don't know yet? We, I don't know that much. I just read the one article, and I know it's of concern. I'd surely like to know more about who is looking into it. Uh, the tire industry themselves might be reviewing uh, the the chemical makeup of their tires and might have some information. I don't know. I, somebody's got to be more knowledgeable than we are for sure. Certainly that is always the case, I believe. But yeah, uh, let me let me begin with um, environmental health and see where we go from there. Okay. Mr. McGee, any other uh, items? We've got about seven minutes left. Nope. Okay, Commissioner Edwards. I guess uh, the only thing I'd finish on maybe, uh, there's there's always lots of issues, but I was quite concerned that in our meeting discussing in stream flow, I guess yesterday, that those folks that should have been kind of in the know didn't seem to be very knowledgeable about uh, what I referred to as leakage or uh, drawing from one aquifer and replacing water in another aquifer. I was, I was quite concerned that they didn't seem to know as much as I would have thought they would know if, if the issue had been studied at all. And, and as far as the numbers, I mean, there are, boy, there's many, many millions of gallons that, uh, are involved in this. I don't know how many, but it's kind of common sense too to me that the the equation that we use to figure out if we're damaging that in-stream flow, I would think anytime we're adding, we seem to only be uh, quantifying what we're doing wrong or what's detrimental to the in-stream flow and not even considering how we are enhancing the in-stream flow. So uh, I know that's a whole other topic of discussion, but I just thought that uh, uh, I'd like to know more. 
Pardon? Well, it was the conference call was what you heard there. Um, oh. Yeah, I, I was thinking a lot about what you, the questions you asked and trying to sort of think through. And I think that, I think that the answer to your confusion, which is very legitimate, I mean, I understand exactly what you're getting at, but I think you kind of have to look at how this unfolded, which is, you know, there are, we, there were certain watersheds or, or basins where the, the, the number of permit exempt wells, Kittitas, I think, was where the ground zero was where they could tell that there was an effect. And then the Supreme Court looked at the broader laws and the water and law and the growth management act and all these different laws and said, you, you can't be doing this this way. Um, and, but nobody knew exactly what the effect was everywhere. It was just, we knew that the wells were having an effect because in Kittitas and a couple other places, it was, it was evident. So they basically shut everything down that you're, this is not a, this is an inconsistent legal scheme. And then the legislature, you know, that really ha was going to have massive, massive uh, ramifications for development in counties across the state. So the legislature raced to find a compromise quickly. And what they came up with was something that's just kind of ballparky, but it was just trying to satisfy all the different interest groups. And it was to say, look, if you can calculate Kind of the maximum amount that these wells could 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 affect in stream flow based on the projection of development and you can come up with projects to offset then we should be good to go it should be neutral you know going forward over 20 years and does that mean that in every ind individual case that that much water is needed to offset probably not for all the reasons that you described commissioner but but nobody was going to get to that level of granular detail in every basin across the state and they wanted a quick formula so that everybody could feel comfortable that development could permits could still go forward and we weren't going to um, damage you know water quantity so they came up with this I think a little more um, I'm calling it ballpark I don't know what to say a little more um, loose uh, calculation to say let's just look at what possibly the wells could do and let's make sure we have enough projects to offset that amount that may be too much but too much water is a good problem to have. That's my yeah. sense, kind of how it unfolded, and why you're seeing like not you're not seeing the level of on a on a on a location by location basis the level of analysis that's really complicated because there are, you know it depends on you you know that leakage that you're talking about. Sometimes depending on the hydrology, sometimes that permeates right down into the lower layers. Other times it runs across into into surface water and replenishes streams and it depends on the soil composition and the rock and the and the, the the hydrology under the ground of those aquifers whether they're going down or up i mean there's so many different things that it's really hard to put it to say there's this much leakage and that's creating this much benefit to a stream yeah no i it's going to be complicated but Boy, there's such a big difference between Eastern Washington and Western Washington, you know, as far as that water flow. I I guess I have the advantage of being older than you folks. So I've been uh, in that Deschutes River drainage my whole life as a little kid, right up until recent. And I haven't seen any difference as far as water flow myself. Uh, in summertime, it, it gets lower obviously uh because we go sometimes you know 90 days or something with no rain that type of thing but i just want to make sure that we don't end up in uh some unnecessary litigation where we're we're taking something that we might be ended up getting in trouble over even though the state we're trying to follow all the state laws and stuff right yeah i don't know i didn't make it very clear I don't think on uh, what could potentially develop. I mean, I, I did mention the drug laws that are changing. Who knew that was going to happen and what's going to happen, what's going to come about because of that. It's just, I think we need more information. And I think in the end, and I will comment that I can hear you fine today. <laughs> Boy, yesterday I had a hard time hearing you. Uh, oh, really? I, oh, yeah. yeah. Struggling with my mic. I don't know why. Yeah. Okay, so well, anyway, I apologize for not picking up on that earlier. The conference. Okay, it's 11:30. Yeah.
And uh, with that, we're going to adjourn and we'll be back at one o'clock for peer report updates. Thanks, everybody.